again. I'm going to plan to record the lectures like I did last semester. I hope that was useful, so I'll continue to put them on YouTube and um, I'll create the same folder in MU Online class recordings that I did last semester. Um, this is hydraulic engineering. <coughs> Welcome. This will be your favorite class uh, of all time at Marshall. Uh, breaking your love for fluid mechanics, which you took last semester. So it's going to be a new high this semester. And the reason why you're going to like it is you're going to learn things in this class that make you valuable. It's knowledge and skills that will make you valuable. It's going to take you from a 8 to $10 an hour type worker, maybe, if you don't have previous experience in another field. It's going to take you up to, I don't know, $18, $20 an hour. You know, you get a good internship where, where they've got money and they can afford to pay you what you're worth. So you'll have skills that are actually marketable. That's why I like teaching this class is because um, it's more application. Fluid mechanics was a lot of theory, and, uh, and I was excited to teach you theory, but I'm really excited to teach you applications. So this is a good class, and this will be a nice semester. Uh, what we're looking at, anybody seen this before? Anybody familiar with the picture here? Looks dry. This isn't in West Virginia, right? <laughs> yes, it's the Hoover Dam. That's right, yeah. Big a hydroelectric project out in the western United States. And we're going to talk about a little bit more in terms of uh, power calculations. We did just a bit of that last semester when we were uh, in Chapter 7 of Fluid Mechanics. I've handed out the notes, and I'll get to this in more detail later, but uh, one of the suggestions from last semester was to eliminate the lines here on the handouts, and I would love to do that. They annoy me too. I think it's uh, it's stupid. They shouldn't have the, the lines on the handouts. I don't know how to do that, though. So if any of you know how to print it out so it's just three on the left and blank on the right, let me know, and I'll print it that way. Within reason. You know, if it's like a 20-minute procedure and i got to take a bitmap and import that to Photoshop, obviously that's not going to happen. But if it's a simple setting, which I've overlooked, and I don't, um, unfortunately I don't think I have, but if you know how to do it, let me know. Anyways, um, your first assignment is, uh, is there, homework one. It's due on Tuesday, uh, January 21st. Slide under my office door. I'm going to have to remind myself why I said slide it under my door rather than turn it in in class. But the conference is on Thursday, though, right? Maybe I meant Thursday. Maybe I meant Thursday and I wrote Tuesday. Let's see here. Well, I'll get back to you why I said slide in my office door, but it's due on Tuesday the 21st. Um, I'm going to give you this schedule handout once we go through some uh, actual material today. We'll get to the syllabus and the paperwork. Um, but I, I think that's actually, oh, it's because uh, 14 January 2013. That explains it. This is a slide from last semester. So uh, 2014, let me, I forgot to make a few updates. There we go. Forget about that office door stuff. That doesn't apply. It's due on Tuesday the 21st. We're going to be talking about uh, flow resistance and the textbook. Anybody have a copy of the textbook they can hold up and wave around? Nobody got theirs yet? What's the deal with that? You did the textbook rental thing from Amazon and they didn't show up? There it is. It's like Sasquatch. The bookstore may have a custom printed version of this that's just selected chapters, and that's fine. The way I used to do it was, before it was available for rent for $30 or $40, um, this book, I think, if you get the actual copy of it and pay cash, it's like $160. And so last semester and the semester before, I just, since we're starting in Chapter 7, I had the textbook order from 7 forward. Um, it didn't end up saving that much money. I think it was about $100 instead of $160. Um, but I did it until I noticed that it was available for rent for so much cheaper. Where would you get yours? Amazon. Amazon? You bought it. Yeah. Because he knows he's going to love it. $14 to rent? Pretty cheap. But you haven't got it yet. It's a good deal if they send it to you. It's a bad deal if they don't. Right? Okay. Well, let's hope that it arrives soon because you've got homework due on Tuesday, January 21st. But uh, chapters 1 through 6 is basically review material covered already in fluid mechanics. Um, I like that book for fluid mechanics and this one for hydraulic engineering. And you will too. 
you'll be glad that, uh, that we're using this. I, I actually stumbled around looking for a good hydraulics textbook for several years before I finally uh, settled on this one. It's a good one, but uh, hopefully they arrive. Um, if, you, if, you, if they don't and you have to go to the bookstore, you can use what they've got there because it's almost certainly, is it like a floppy paperback kind of a thing? Yeah, it's, it's the custom print, just selected chapters. And do you remember how much they were charging for it? $144? Yeah. Chegg? Okay. And it's arrived? All right. Any questions about the textbook? After what we go through today, we've got a couple examples we're going to do on the board. You'll be able to start on that homework if you had the book. Maybe some of your classmates will take pity on you and will photocopy the uh, first couple of problems for you. All right, so once we get through some discussion of flow resistance, I'll give you the syllabus and we'll talk about the mechanics of the course. I want to talk about the interesting stuff first before I bore you with paperwork. Um, this is a water bridge in Germany, and that is not Photoshop. That's a real image of a real thing. And if you look at it, what you can see is that there's a river. The lower river is an actual river that was there long ago. Uh, this part hasn't always been there. It's relatively new, just opened maybe 10 years ago. And uh, what happened was there was a, a, a couple of industrial areas inside of Germany. I'm not really a well acquainted with the geography of where this is, but there were several industrial centers that they had to send um, raw materials and finished products by uh, rail. But the bridge was seven mi several miles uh, upstream of this, and they thought barge traffic would be economically feasible. And so they built a bridge to connect two, uh, two rivers. And there are a series of locks because the, uh, on either side of this water bridge, the water is at different elevations. And so they have to lift the boats up and lower them down in order to get them to the right elevation, similar to the lock and dam system that's present here on the Ohio River that runs next to Huntington. But I uh, start off the semester with this just as an illustration of some of the interesting challenges that engineers who are working in hydraulics will sometimes face. We probably won't get to the level of designing a water bridge over another river this semester, but um, you know maybe the semester after that you'd be ready for something like that. What we will be covering this semester is two basic divisions. Um, we're going to be looking about the uh, quantity, timing, and distribution of, of water in two locations, um, in closed conduits and in open channels. Those are the, the two broad divisions of the course. And so water in pressurized pipes is something that you've already got a taste in fluid mechanics. We did some experiments, for example, with uh, pressure loss through the pipe rack, and you'll remember that the small diameter pipe had a much greater pressure loss than the large diameter pipe. When you plugged in the pressure meter, it was measuring a change in pressure that was much higher. I don't remember the exact numbers. I think it was maybe 100 kilopascals over that one meter section. And then when you had the large diameter pipe, which was down on the bottom, the pressure drop was so minimal, it was maybe just one kilopascal, hardly measurable compared to the instrument noise that was there. And why was that? Why is it that there was more pressure change through the small diameter pipe than through the big one. Anybody remember what the theory was on that? Why there's more pressure change? Okay, so first of all, there's the continuity relationship which says small diameter pipe and big diameter pipe. In the small diameter pipe, water is moving fast. In the big diameter pipe, the water is moving slow. That's a really important distinction between the two pipes. What else was it that caused a larger change in pressure? Friction, more energy loss due to friction. Okay, fast, more energy loss. And you mentioned friction, and we'll get into that. Um, uh, this is less energy loss. Energy loss is proportional to uh, velocity. Actually, it's a function of velocity squared. And um, what we're talking about is a change in pressure. And change in pressure is one way to, to measure 
a change in energy. Remember that there are three places that energy can be located in a system where water is flowing through a pipe like this. Um, uh, energy can be located in elevation. Energy can be located in pressure. And energy can be located in velocity. And uh, I guess we could say that the, the, this is energy locations. And as water flows from point to point, as water goes from location one towards location two, remember that we tracked how much energy there was with the energy equation. And that said that the pressure at one divided by gamma, which is the unit weight of water, plus the elevation at one, plus the velocity head, and velocity head is V squared divided by 2G, where G is the gravitational uh, acceleration constant. If there was no energy loss, then it would be equal to each of those three terms at location 2. And we assumed that there's no energy loss when we had an inviscid fluid. Remember that hypothetical fluid that has no viscosity? And uh, when we were applying Bernoulli's equation, then we would assume that we had an inviscid fluid that was in steady uniform flow, and we were measuring along the streamline how the behavior was. But when we step away from that assumption that there's some mythical inviscid fluid, and we accept that all fluids have viscosity and there's going to be energy losses, then we have on the right hand side of the, the uh, equation here plus head losses. And then the energy at one is equal to the energy at two plus whatever is lost in transit from one to two. So you've had some exposure to flow through pipes and the reason why there was more energy loss in the small diameter pipe is the water's moving faster Energy loss is proportional to velocity squared, and, uh, and frictional losses is what we're going to spend the next uh, couple of lectures trying to nail down really accurate ways to measure friction loss in pipe. It's not simple, but we've got some good equations and some good numerical methods that will allow us to estimate pretty reliably what the energy loss is to pipe friction. So any questions so far? as we try and remember what we were talking about in the early weeks of December. A lot has happened since then, right? We all had a lot of eggnog. We don't remember much about the, uh, the holidays. Well, of course, we remember the energy equation. Who could forget? Um, so that's flow through pipes. A lot of the same principles and methods we'll apply also carry over to flow through channels, uh, but not all of them. And so, uh, the second part of the course is talking about flow through channels and uh, when it'll really get interesting is when we say we want to estimate what's happening in a channel when conditions aren't steady and uniform. Um, and so that's when it gets interesting. Um, this has implications that tie into uh, legal matters, economics, financial. If you took engineering economy from me, then uh, you'll know that water projects can be very easily integrated with estimates of the time value of money. For example, if you're going to put in a water network in a city, then you can find out uh, how much needs to be collected in revenue over a 50-year time frame to pay for that uh, investment that's going in now. And we'll have a project this semester that you have just that uh, kind of opportunity. You'll be using water gems to design a water network in a hypothetical town and you'll go all the way from estimating what the demand for water would be in that hypothetical town uh, to designing the size of the required pipe network and finally finding out what the, uh, the cost of the project will be. And um, so here's a picture of a pipe network that's pretty complicated. This is a water treatment plant. And uh, this is a water treatment plant in Indiana that I did some experiments at when I was working in, on my PhD. This is in Indianapolis. And at this particular treatment plant, they have ultraviolet disinfection 
to decontaminate the water. They shine a really bright UV light and that'll kill bacteria and viruses. But they really only have it as a backup because they're also chlorinating the water at this plant. Uh, this particular plant uh, has sand filtration with activated carbon in the sand filter, so it would be effective at removing that chemical that was released in uh, the Charleston water supply last week. I'm sure everybody's sick of hearing all about the uh, water emergency in Charleston. How many people here were affected actually didn't have water? Just the one, huh? Couldn't buy any bottled water. Couldn't buy any bottled water. Well, that's not really affected. This guy went without showers for a week. <laughs> You still shower? You weren't worried? No? Well, when you get a third arm growing out of your chest, hopefully it won't come to that. Yeah, you know, I don't think that the concentrations were uh, high enough for anything like that. But um, one of the things that we touched on just very briefly last semester was uh, energy grade lines. Remember how we were drawing little illustrations that showed where would be the energy grade line and the hydraulic grade line? And we thought of it as how high the water would rise to if we put a piezometer in a pipe. And drawings such as that are really important when designing a, uh, a water treatment system because you want as much of the water to flow through the plant under gravity as possible. You can see that there are pumps in this picture and you don't want to have unnecessary pumps in there because they consume electricity. And there are some water treatment plants where uh, they have a really high mountainous reservoir and they happen to have enough um, head that they can push the water all the way through the treatment plant under gravity and they don't need any pumps whatsoever. But that's the exception rather than the rule. Uh, here's a picture of an open channel. I keep bringing the lights back up and I shouldn't. Here's a, an open channel in the United Arab Emirates where I lived for a couple of years before coming to Marshall and it's showing the barren mountainside. Obviously it doesn't rain very much there in the UAE. They get about four inches of rain per year. And does anybody know how much rain we get here in Huntington on an annual basis? 40. About 40, 45 wet years maybe more than that. So they get one-tenth the water in the UAE that we get here in West Virginia. But the thing is, is they get almost all of that water in two or three days. And so when it rains, it rains heavily. And obviously the, uh, the hillside is unvegetated. And so not much of that water is going to be seeping into the ground. It's very steep, rocky soil. And so uh, this channel will be unused 363 days per year. And then two days per year, it's uh, at capacity and flowing into the ocean. It's an interesting situation to, uh, to design something like that. And you can see that there's some sediment that's been suspended. As the, uh, as the stream comes out of the mountains, the slopes decrease. And then as the slope is decreasing, because the water is about to go into the ocean, then the velocity of the water slows down and it can't uh, keep the sediment suspended as well. So they have to uh, scrape out the sediments that accumulate in that channel on an annual basis or else it would get clogged with sediments. So that's an in interesting illustration of, uh, of some of the things that you'll get to in the second part of the course. And here's a reservoir up in California. Um, and uh, I don't remember why I put this slide in other than I love looking at pictures of water. And I took this picture. Maybe that's why it is. I was so proud that I took this picture. So we can all enjoy it together. All right. This is an illustration of uh, the hypothetical town that you're going to be designing the water network. And I change the map around each year a little bit. This is, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, but what you'll be doing is you'll be looking at how much water would be needed by people inside of a town. So you'll start to ask questions like, how much water does the average person use? Um, how much water is required for a nail factory or a golf course? So you'll be applying common sense and critical thinking and uh, accessing resources that estimate those very things to come up with a demand estimation. And that's the beginning, the beginning stages of engineering design is to ask yourself, what's the problem? What's the scope of the issue that needs to be solved? Uh, and then you'll go through the process of drawing this network in water gems. And these blue lines represent pipes 
And the green arrows represent where there would be an outlet from the pipe. And so you'll look at, over a 24-hour period, how the demand goes up, how the demand goes down. You'll look at what are the peak demands over a, a one-year period when uh, obviously in summertime people are going to be using more water than in the wintertime. And so it's a good opportunity for you to, uh, to think about what sorts of problems and uncertainties you'll face when you actually graduate. You know, so much of the work you do as a junior is problems from the back of the book where every input value you need to solve the homework problem is given to you. And that's so completely divorced from what you actually do when you graduate and you have a project that you're working on and um, your clients are not going to give you a neat problem statement that has, you know, L equals 14, H equals 7. You know, they're not going to define the variables for you. There won't be a constant table in the back of the book. Everything's going to be so ambiguous and, uh, and sometimes what's most distracting is you'll have too much information. You'll have uh, 100 parameters that you don't need uh, that are obscuring your vision of the one thing that you do need to know. And so getting you more well acquainted and more comfortable with uh, ill-defined problems is one of the main purposes of the design project that we'll get to later this semester. And so, you know, that's a little bit uncomfortable at first. It was uncomfortable for me the first time my boss gave me a problem and, you know, he didn't know how to solve the problem, so I couldn't go ask him how to design this culvert using a particular piece of software. And uh, he didn't know how big the culvert should be, and so you have to do a little bit of independent research. And when you're just used to problems from the back of the book, that's uncomfortable. And so we want to gradually get you uh, a little bit more confident in your abilities and certain how to do the design process. And so in answer to the question, what does a hydraulic engineer do, what do you think in, a, in an illustration like this, what would be the job of the hydraulic engineer? Okay. And the way that you make sure people have an, an adequate amount of water is to ensure that the pressure is adequate. It's, it's pressure that drives water from place to place. And so what you'll be balancing in this, you're trying to optimize the system. You want to make the pipe as small as possible because that's cheap to have a small pipe. If you have a big pipe, of course that's going to work, but it's going to be really expensive to have a big diameter pipe because it's got a lot of metal in it. It'll need more excavation. It'll be heavier, so it'll take more people to install it. You want to put in a little pipe. You want to just barely give people enough pressure that they can take a shower. You know, they say that anyone can build a bridge, um, but only an engineer can build a bridge that just barely won't fail. You, know, you want, you want some, your design to be efficient. You want it to meet the objectives, but not anything beyond that. And so you know, you'll spend hour after hour trying to make this pipe a little bit smaller and this pipe a little bit smaller, meanwhile maintaining enough pressure at all the points in the network so that people can have enough water. And so pipe sizing will be the hydraulic engineer's job on that one. Now what is the design process? It's starting with identifying the problem and finishing with optimizing the solution so that it's uh, as cost efficient as possible while meeting the requirements that you have. So now, flow resistance. Uh, we're in chapter seven in the book, and uh, I'm not going to give you reading quizzes this semester. I'm not going to try and force you to read the textbook, but I will say that every once in a while, you're going to need to know something from the book that we don't have time to cover in class so that you can solve the homework assignment. So um, you know, the Morris and Wigert criteria, just to, to throw one thing out there. Uh, we'll maybe have one slide explaining the basics of the Morris and Wigert criteria, but for you to understand the background and the significance of some of the things, you're going to have to do the reading yourself. And so I'd recommend that you uh, flip through the textbook chapter before a lecture, and I'll give you a schedule that says which sections correspond to which lecture. You know, flip through it in advance, and then after the lecture, uh, read through the textbook sections in their entirety. And they're not that long. I think at most it'll be two or three pages for each lecture. So it's, it's not a verbose book. It's relatively thin considering they're charging you uh, $160 if you pay full price for it. But uh, this stuff comes from chapter seven. And flow resistance is illustrated here. 
uh, in a pipe. And then here, this image is kind of interesting. I want to see if, if anybody can figure out what's going on with that other image. There I did it again, dim the lights. It's like a disco in here with the lights on and off so much, right? What is this a picture of? What's that? Sort of. You could call it a canal. Uh, on the left side, not shown, would be a dam. So this is on the side of a dam. And, uh, okay, sort of, sort of a spillway. What do you think that all these little bars represent? What's that? Stair steps, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the reason why we've got different colors is colors are representing different velocities. Uh, what color do you think is fast and what color is slow? Red is fast, blue is slow, exactly. This is the result of a, of a computer model. It's called computational fluid dynamics. And so what they did with this model was they drew in the geometry of this structure and then they said, let's put water through it. And the model says where the velocity is going to be high and where the velocity is going to be low. And this is a structure that actually is meant to allow fish to migrate upstream when there's a dam. Uh, fish can't jump. Remember the, the first picture? Some fish can jump pretty far, but I don't think any fish <laughs> would be able to migrate through this dam. Uh, now, in, in this instance, I don't think that they have any sort of uh, bypass for the fish to migrate. I think that um, they may, may have thought that was a lost cause. But there are a lot of dams where, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, where uh, fish migration is pretty important, you know, like salmon running, things like that, where, you know, the fish may, may be able to jump three feet. And so they'll have a stair step and allow the... Uh, uh, some path for the migrating fish to get upstream. And so uh, here, flow resistance is a function of a lot of different parameters. It's a function of fluid viscosity. And remember that the more viscous a fluid is, the more resistance there will be when it flows through a pipe. So if we have air flowing through a pipe, uh, remember the one meter pipe rack in the lab, uh, there's taps one meter apart on a horizontally oriented pipe. If air is flowing through those pipes and you plug in the pressure, uh, the differential pressure meter, you won't be able to measure any difference in pressure because the viscosity of air is so low. Um, there really wouldn't be any energy loss. But if you have water going through there, then yes, you can measure a change in pressure. If you had mercury going through there, mercury is more viscous than water, there'd be an even bigger pressure drop. And if you had um, maple syrup flowing through there, then there'd be an even larger uh, pressure drop because viscosity will increase the uh, the energy loss. So flow resistance is a, a function of fluid viscosity. Also the flow conditions. We've already talked about how velocity is one of the parameters that affects energy loss. That if it's moving fast you have more energy loss because there's going to be more resistance. If, if it's moving quickly then there's more resistance to that motion. Uh, the depth of the water flowing, if it's an open channel situation, if it's a river, then the, uh, the shallow river is going to experience on a uh, depth basis. If this is the bottom of a stream and it's a shallow stream and it's flowing this way, obviously the water that's just very close to the stream is going to have more resistance effects than if, if it was a really deep river that's flowing that way, then the water that's up here at the top of the river isn't close to the uh, solid surface that's imparting the resistance because this solid surface is pushing on the water in the opposite direction of that water's movement. Um, uniformity of conduit means that if we have a pipe that has lots of bends and angles in it, that will induce more turbulence and there will be more resistance to flow. And the degree of turbulence, which we had a, an experiment last semester where we visualized turbulence. It was that uh, transparent pipe that was vertically oriented and we were injecting the dye. And as the velocity increased, the dye was getting more scattered. And then when we decreased the velocity, then the dye was just going straight through there. And as turbulence increases, so does the energy loss. 
because there is uh, basically a portion of the velocity that's not going parallel to flow. Some of the velocity um, uh, vectors will be towards the pipe or even backwards if there are eddies in the, in the stream. Uh, flow cross-section geometry and boundary roughness, so the pipe material, in other words, when we talk about boundary roughness. And uh, we classify flow into laminar and turbulent with the Reynolds number, and remember from last semester that Reynolds number is the velocity of the flow times the diameter of the pipe divided by the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. That's how you can calculate the Reynolds number. And Roughly speaking, if it's below 2,000, then the flow is laminar. If it's above 4,000, then it's turbulent. And that range 2,000 to 4,000 is a, transi a transition zone where the flow may be laminar or turbulent depending on uh, what it was before it got into the transition zone. Transition, laminar, turbulent. You have this figure in your textbook. Don't worry. You're not going to have to try and rely on that tiny little one from the notes there. Once you get your textbook, there is a Moody diagram. This is called a Moody diagram. And uh, it's in the book. And we're going to talk about how this illustrates resistance to flow as a function of a, a variety of those parameters, we've just gone through a list. You know, we went through this list and said velocity affects roughness, uh, ru velocity, roughness, uh, flow condition, whether it's laminar or turbulent. And uh, this diagram takes almost all of those things into account and gives you a way of calculating how much energy loss there's going to be through a pipe. Um, let me acquaint you with the different axes here. First of all, uh, on the right vertical axis, it says relative roughness. And it has K sub S divided by D. And one thing I'll mention is that depending on the reference, sometimes K sub S is used as a variable and sometimes epsilon is used as a variable. They mean the same thing. What that's called is equivalent sand roughness. Those two things are called equivalent sand roughness. And what it means is, um, it's if you have a pipe, and let's say that we zoom in on that pipe so we're looking at it really under a microscope, then the pipe's going to have roughness, right? You know, whether it's that pipe in the lab that's literally coated with sand on the inside, or if it's cast iron, whatever the material is, if you, if you really zoom in on a really close basis, it'll have roughness to it. And if you were to find the average height of these roughness elements and represent it as a diameter, then the equivalent sand roughness is what we're talking about here as K sub S or epsilon. And so here on this vertical axis, it's saying that on this scale, we need to find the relative roughness. And it's K sub S to D. So let's say that we have a, uh, a pipe that has a K sub S of 0.26 millimeters. I think that that's the, relative, that's, that's the equivalent sand roughness for cast iron. So if we had a cast iron pipe that is 0.25 meters in diameter, then the way that we'd find the relative roughness there is we'd divide the equivalent sand roughness, the K sub S, by the diameter of the pipe. And that would give us a relative roughness. And so a relative roughness will be if we have a pipe diameter that's 0 0.25 meters, that is 250 millimeters. If we have a K sub S or an epsilon that is 0 0.26 millimeters, and that depends on what the pipe's made out of. Like I mentioned before, that would be cast iron. Um, then we can find the K sub S to D just simply by dividing the 0 0.26 millimeters by 250 millimeters. 
And it's important that we get the units the same. We wouldn't want to have 0.26 divided by 0.25 because then the units would be dissimilar and we'd end up looking in the wrong place on the figure there. And so here the equivalent, I'm sorry, the relative roughness is 0 0.00104. And the first thing that we'll do in using a Moody diagram is say, all right, well, for this pipe, based on its material type and its diameter, our uh, K sub S to D puts us in the 0.0014. 4, 104. And so uh, this is 0.001, this is 0 0.002, so it's going to be just barely above this line here, this black line here. So if, if there are 100 increments between here and here, we'd be four of those 100 increments above 0 0.001. So it's essentially just barely above that line. And so you can see that these lines curve once they get past the dashed line. And that dashed line uh, delineates the transition zone from the rough turbulent zone. And that brings up, uh, the next thing we need to do is calculate the Reynolds number for the situation. And the way we can find the Reynolds number is the velocity times the diameter of the pipe divided by the kinematic viscosity. And so let's take a look at the Reynolds number here. Reynolds number is the velocity, the diameter, and the kinematic viscosity. Water is flowing 30 meters per minute. That's the velocity. That's not very useful. 30 meters per minute. Okay, well, we can say that we want to divide that by 60 seconds per minute, and that's 0 0.5 meters per second. So that gives us the velocity that we need, 0 0.5 meters per second. And the diameter of this pipe, 0 0.25. I'm back to expressing the diameter in terms of meters because everything else is going to have length units of meters rather than here where I substituted millimeters so that I could be consistent. Anybody remember what the kinematic viscosity is for water? Good. And what, how about the units? Pretty close. Meter squared per second. Very good. Okay, so uh, the Reynolds number here is 125,000. 125,000. Or in other words, 1.25 times 10 to the fifth. So we already found that we're on this line, basically. Now we need to look at the Reynolds number. So 1.25 times 10 to the fifth. This is 1 times 10 to the fourth. 2 times 10 to the fourth. 3 times 10 to the fourth. 4 times 10 to the fourth. And so on. Now this is 1 times 10 to the sixth. So if this is 2 times 10 to the sixth, then this little line in between them is 1.5 times 10 to the sixth. And you'll notice that since this is a logarithmic axis, that it's not halfway between 1 and 2. So if you look from 1 to 10, 5 isn't halfway between 1 and 10 on a logarithmic scale. And so we're going to need to go more than halfway towards this line to get to the point where we've got 0.125. It's probably about here. So if you draw a line up, a vertical line up, and we're trying to intersect with this line. And so it's starting to curve, and we want to go up, and it's, boy, that's convenient. It's right about where it crosses that axis there. It's almost like it had been selected on purpose to be where it crossed that line, because if we go over now, 0 0.22 is the friction factor. So F is 0 0.22, and the way that we found that intercept was by following the roughness, the, the relative roughness curve, intersecting it with the Reynolds number, and then going over to find the friction factor that corresponds. This is a graphical way of calculating the F value. We also have equations 
that we'll use to calculate the F value. Uh, some of the equations are implicit and some of them are explicit, which means that the variable, um, well, uh, the implicit means that the variable is on both sides of the equation, so it's a little bit challenging to solve. It requires iteration um, to most accurately solve for the F value. But you can always fall back on the Moody diagram. Any questions on how to use the Moody diagram? Who cares what F is? That's what you should be asking. Who cares? If somebody asked who cares during each of my lectures this semester, I'd be delighted. You know, like, provided it's the right time. <laughs> you know? Not like, if, as I'm handing back your exam, don't say who cares then. But say who cares when, when I say, and here's the F. Well, who cares? What, what does F mean? Uh, F, just to, to give you a sneak preview of where we're headed, the reason it matters, is that energy loss due to pipe friction is a function of F. This is the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. So the reason why we want to know F is F basically tells you uh, how rough the pipe is. And so you'll be solving like what the F, you're going to try and find out what is the F value so that, that you can classify the roughness of the pipe. And, uh, and from that, you'll know how much energy loss there is due to pipe friction. And so there's other things as well, the length of the pipe, the velocity of the water that's going through it, the diameter. And we'll get into this later, but I wanted to give you the context of what is this F value that the Moody diagram is trying to find. What does that mean there? Uh, kind of like laminar flow. Yeah, if, if you have laminar conditions, which are pretty rare, Remember, we hardly ever have laminar conditions. But if you do have laminar flow, F is super easy to calculate. It's just 64 divided by the Reynolds number. But that only works up until the uh, Reynolds number of 2,000. So if you have laminar conditions, then calculating F is very simple. Otherwise, the Moody diagram is the easy way, and the Colbrick equation is the accurate way, but hard. And the Jane equation is sort of in between. And we'll learn those. Other questions? All right. Consider water flowing through a pipe on the left here. On the right is water flowing down a, an inclined stream. But first, we'll look at the pipe. Um, We've got an element of water and we're going to do a force balance. We'll consider the forces acting externally on this element of water. And remember that pressure times area is as though an external force. If, if you've got a control volume and you're looking at what's the water on the outside of that control volume doing, the water that's on the other side of this imaginary boundary here is pushing on the water that's inside the control volume. And the same thing's happening here is that the pressurized water that's on the other side of this imaginary line, you know, the pipe continues. The water is resisting, so it's pushing that way at two. So those are both forces. And if you remember, the units of force is a newton. And so pressure, which is newtons per meter squared, and area, which is meter squared, multiply those together and that gives you units of force. And so We've got some amount of newtons pushing the water that way, and the water is getting pushed this way from the water that's on the other side. Uh, then there's the weight of the water acting down, and since this pipe is inclined, also acting in the direction of flow, a small amount. And then right here, um, we've got the boundary shear stress multiplied by the perimeter multiplied by the length. And so that is the, uh, the resistance to flow. We can do a, uh, a balance of the forces and find that when we have steady, uniform flow, conditions are in equilibrium. By the way, what does steady, uniform flow mean? First of all, steady. What does that mean? The velocity isn't changing with respect to time. 
So it means that the velocity now is the same as the velocity in a minute. It means that the velocity isn't changing with respect to time. So that's what steady means. What about uniform? If we have uniform flow, that means the velocity isn't changing with respect to position. And so here, we've got a pipe where the diameter is constant. That means it's not speeding up as you go in the direction of flow. It means that the velocity at 1, the velocity of the water at 1, is the same as the velocity of the water at 2 because the pipe diameter is constant. So we have steady, uniform flow. Equilibrium means that all of the forces are in balance. And so look at that equation. P1 times A is the force that's acting to the right in the direction of flow. Then if you subtract P2 times A, it's acting to the left in the direction of flow. It's this inclined uh, vector that's going to be our direction of flow. Plus gamma LA. So what is gamma LA? Length times area gives us the volume of that element. And multiplying it by gamma gives us what? It's the weight of the water. So we'll have the weight of the water inside of that element. And then sine of alpha is the component of that weight of the water that's in the direction of flow. So most of the water's weight is downward. But some of it is in the direction of flow because it's inclined, right? So that is also going towards the right. So that's why it's plus. And then minus the shear stress times the perimeter times the length. So what is perimeter times length? What dimension is that? Perimeter is around the pipe. And then length is that segment length. What's that? It's the inside surface area. Right. So the shear stress times the surface area is going to give us the overall force of resistance. And so as the water moves to the right, the pipe is pushing on the water. And it's pushing in the opposite direction of movement. And everything's in equilibrium. Equilibrium means that it's not speeding up. So the, it's not speeding up because of equilibrium. And it is in equilibrium by definition because it's not speeding up. So everything's in balance. Um, would, would you expect the pressure at 2 to be bigger or less than the pressure at 1? Why do you think it's bigger? OK, because it's lower. So the hydrostatic principle would maybe increase the pressure. But on the other hand, what's the on the other hand? OK, velocity, uh, because that's downstream, the pressure is decreasing in the direction of the movement. So we actually don't know just by looking which of those two effects is more important. You know, like maybe it's a super smooth glass pipe. And uh, maybe it's a relatively steep pipe. So maybe it's actually increasing. The pressure may be increasing from 1 to 2 because of the hydrostatic effect. Or if it's a rough pipe and a relatively shallow slope, then maybe the pressure at 2 is less than the pressure at 1. But regardless of that, the uh, equilibrium will work out. That uh, if the pressure at 2 is really low, it must be because there was a lot of uh, resistance to flow. This, this term here is the resistance to flow term. And this term here accounts for the hydrostatic principle, which is that uh, water lower down in a tank or in a pipe or any kind of system, that when you go down through a fluid, the pressure increases. That's the hydrostatic principle. And so this equilibrium expression accounts for all of those things. From here, we can say, well, there's some change in pressure. And uh, by definition, we're going to say that delta P divided by gamma is H sub F. So when I say H sub F here, that's what I mean. I mean delta P divided by gamma. So look at all the other terms on that top equation there. So P1 minus P2, that's the delta P. And if we divide it by gamma, we're going to have to divide every other term by gamma as well. And so that's no problem on gamma L A sine of alpha. Uh, the other term 
Uh, you can see that the, the gamma will be added into the expression there. So for a circular pipe that's flowing full, um, R here stands for hydraulic radius. And hydraulic radius is the area divided by the wetted perimeter. And um, let's say if it's a rectangular conduit, then a wetted perimeter is the perimeter around the edge. So that is P, is the uh, uh, distance along the outside edge. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying outside. It's the inside of the pipe. Distance around the edge, the circumference. And then the area is obviously the cross-sectional area. That's area. Um, if it's a circular pipe that has a diameter of D, then it just so happens that the area is pi D squared divided by 4. And the perimeter is uh, pi D. That's the definition of perimeter in terms of diameter rather than in terms of radius. And what we say is that hydraulic radius, R, is area divided by perimeter. And so if we have pi D squared divided by 4 divided by pi D, then that just gives us D divided by 4. So that is the hydraulic radius for a circular pipe. Hydraulic radius for a circular pipe. Flowing full. And it's important that I said flowing full because what if it was a pipe, a circular pipe, but water was only up to here? Well, then the wetted perimeter would just be the part that water was touching. And it wouldn't be that formula anymore. We won't have to worry about that complication until the very end of the semester. We'll, we'll assume the pipes are full during this first part of the course. So um, we can say that the energy loss due to pipe friction is 4 times the boundary shear stress times the length of the segment divided by the unit weight of the water times diameter. Similar principles apply in open channel. And we'll come back to the applying this equilibrium expression um, to the example of open channel when we get to that second segment of the course. Any questions so far? I'm sure throwing a lot of stuff at you for the first day. It's to make up for all the other classes where they just handed you the syllabus and told you to get out. Maybe. All right. Any questions? So um, S sub F, S means slope, and F means the slope of the energy grade line. There's three different slopes that we're going to be concerned with this semester. We'll be concerned with the slope of the actual pipe. We'll be concerned with the slope of the hydraulic grade line and the slope of the energy grade line. And uh, oftentimes, all three of those slopes are equal. If it is water flowing through a, a river and it's steady, uniform flow, then all three of them will be equal. Um, but if it's water flowing through a pipe, then, uh, then the physical slope of the pipe doesn't necessarily have to equal the slope of the energy grade line. But here, what we're saying is, the slope of the energy grade line, by definition, that is the energy loss due to pipe friction divided by the length of the pipe. And so if we have a pipe like this, and we know, you know it's a certain length long, then how much energy loss there is over that length of pipe segment is how we can calculate the energy grade, the slope of the energy grade line. And that energy grade line slope goes into some of the formulas, some of the design formulas that we'll use later on. Uh, I think in the homework assignment that you've got due next Tuesday, it's going to be due in class. Don't slide it under my door. You crossed that out already, right, from the handout? Uh, 
In that homework assignment, you're going to need to uh, express the boundary shear stress in terms of the slope of the energy grade line. So I've boxed this expression because this is one of the formulas you're going to be applying on the homework assignment. I wanted to make it really clear to you that it's the unit weight of the fluid, the hydraulic radius, and the slope of the energy grade line. All right, well, let's do this uh, shear stress example here. We've got a pipe that you can see is actually inclined. So from left to right, the pipe is going up, but the energy grade line slope is going down. And the slope of the energy grade line is independent of the physical slope of the pipe. The pipe can be pointed up and water's flowing through the pipe this way, and the energy grade line slope is decreasing because as water flows through the pipe, energy is being lost due to pipe friction. So even though the Z is increasing, remember that there are three places that the energy can be. The energy can be in the elevation, it can be in the pressure, or it can be in the velocity. In this case, the diameter of the pipe is constant, and so the, the, the water velocity isn't changing. So between one and two, there isn't going to be any change in the, the liquid velocity. But there is a change in elevation, and there will definitely be a change in the pressure, because the water pressure will be decreasing for two reasons from one to two. In this example, water pressure would be decreasing because of the elevation change between one and two, and the water pressure is also going to be decreasing because of the energy loss due to pipe friction. So, here in this example, we know the diameter of the pipe is 150 millimeters and that the physical slope of the pipe is 0.1 meters of vertical change for every one meter of, uh, of pipe length. And so, if we were able to observe a shear stress on the pipe of 0.45 newtons per square meter, then what does that tell us about the slope of the energy grade line and what would the pressure change be over 100 meters of pipe length? Okay, so we've got a diameter D of 0.15 meters. The physical slope, S0, that means the slope of the pipe itself is 0.1 meters per meter. And the shear stress, 45 newtons per meter squared. And that's how much the water is resisting, it is uh, how much the pipe is pushing on the water. For every square meter of pipe area, the pipe is pushing on the water with a force of 45 newtons, opposite the direction of flow. Okay, remember we can calculate the area, pi d squared divided by 4, and so if we put in the diameter of that pipe, 1, 5 meters squared divided by 4, and that gives us that the area is 0 0.017671 square meters. Uh, the wetted perimeter, and uh, the wetted perimeter here is pi d, and that is 0 0.47124 meters. And we can calculate the hydraulic radius. It's the area divided by the wetted perimeter. And so, just those two things that we've calculated, 0 0.1, 0 0.017671 meters squared divided by 0 0.47124 meters. The hydraulic radius is 0 0.0375. Since this is water flowing through a pipe that's full, the other way we could have calculated hydraulic radius, the shortcut way, is hydraulic radius is D divided by 4 for a pipe where the water is flowing through it full. And so that would just simply be the diameter, 0 0.15 meters divided by 4. It's the same as what we've just calculated, 0 0.0375. So, what is the slope of the energy grade line? The equation tells us that the shear stress is gamma hydraulic radius S sub F. 
where S sub F is the slope of the energy grade line. Uh, it does, as units of meters. Thank you. I should have written those as units of meters. Yeah, because area is meter squared and wetted perimeter is meters. So hydraulic radius definitely does. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, so slope of the energy grade line is boundary shear stress, the unit weight, times the hydraulic radius. So 45 newtons per meter squared divided by the unit weight of water, 9810 newtons per meter cubed. That's a constant we'll be using again this semester. If you don't know what the temperature of the water is, so that you can actually look up the uh, unit weight for that temperature, just use the default value, 9810 newtons per meter cubed as the physical constant for water. And the hydraulic radius is 0 0.0375 meters. And so now the slope of the energy grade line, that will not have units. And we find it is 0 0.12232 meters per meter. Um, so what I want to box for you is S sub F is independent of S naught. Um, this is the slope of the energy grade line. In other words, there's a line, this top one, that represents the total amount of energy in the system. And the total amount of energy, as you flow from one towards two, the total energy that's in the water is decreasing. And where is that energy going? Some of it is being lost uh, as the elevation increases, but that's not why the energy grade line is sloped, because as the elevation increases, it's just an exchange of energy. That's where pressure is being exchanged for elevation. So the reason why this is sloped is because of the pipe friction. This H sub F, if this was a, a narrower pipe, then remember it would be a steeper slope. When we were drawing the energy grade lines last semester, we'd have a shallow slope for a big pipe and a steep slope for a small diameter pipe, just to illustrate that the rate of energy loss is greater in a small diameter pipe. Um, but the thing uh, that's important to keep in mind is that this, the energy grade line slope is independent of the physical slope of the pipe. We're going to leave it here for today and pick up on this slide for the second part of this example when we get together on Thursday because I want to give you the rest of this paperwork. We've only got 10 minutes of class left. So let's do the syllabus and the schedule. <laughs>